Okay, everybody, I'm going to get started. Um, I'm Professor Steve Keane from the University of the School of Business here. And what I'll be talking about are the, the GFC. You know, who, who doesn't know what those initials stand for? You know, if I ask a question in America, most people would have put their hands up because that acronym is a uniquely Australian acronym. When they talk about it in America, they'll talk about the global financial crisis. They don't use the acronym. Or they'll talk about um, the lesser repression, as they're calling it now. So it is something which is a uniquely Australian thing to use that abbreviation. I'll just turn out the lights, and I've got a bit of an audience here that can do this. Uh, I'm pleased to say most of the lecture theatre has got better lighting than this. It's really quite problematic to try to read that and keep the lights going. So, what is the GFC? Well, what it really is now, and it's taken a long time for us to, the economists to realise this, it's the longest and deepest downturn since the Great Depression. Now, in Australia, I've got to emphasise that because it's been a pretty mild crisis. The attitude people have got here is crisis, what crisis? Very largely, but we can now date it from when the bank, of the particular bank in Paris, of all places, shut down three of the accounts it managed in America with subprime funds inside them because of they, they simply couldn't trade them anymore, and that's where we now date the crisis from. And of course, it's been very mild here in Australia, but it's been very long in America and very, very deep in Europe. This, this graph will give you an idea of just how severe the crisis is. That's the rate of unemployment. In, five, in four countries around the world. The top one, the, the highest rate you can see there is Spain. There's a dotted line, you can see we've got V and P mark. That's when the Bank of National Party shut down those funds. So we really can time it from starting pretty much that particular event. Unemployment in Spain is now 25%. That's not youth unemployment. That's everybody between the age of 15 and 64. So 25% of the people of any age, workable age in Spain are out of a job. In Greece, it's 23%. Now, that's a depression. Anybody's language that is not a recession, that is a depression. It's as bad as the 1920s, the 1930s. The red line is America. Their unemployment rates are heading down. It peaked at about 10%, but it's going nowhere. If you actually look at any other period of unemployment in America after a recession, there'd be a peak and then a very sudden drop-off from the peak. This is like a plateau. It's reached a level that's gone kind of horizontal. Australia is down the bottom there. We actually are the best performing country in the OECD in terms of unemployment, lowest rate going. But still, it rose over what occurred beforehand. Now, of course, most economists are unaware that the remarkable thing about this crisis is not just how long it's gone on for, but how not only little warning that economists give, most of them are saying, put your umbrellas away, it's sunshine forever. And my favourite statement of all of these came out of the Organisation for Economic Cooperation and Development, the OECD, which publishes a biannual report in all countries in the world, and where the treasuries in each country really strive to get the best possible argument they can get to sell their own country. This is the OECD talking about the global economy in June of 2007, two months before the crisis began. And they say that the, when they read the previous one in, in autumn, which was, uh, it, it's, we're talking the European and the Northern Hemisphere, so their autumn is our, our spring. Um, the OECD took the view that the US was not heralding a period of worldwide economic weakness. And they said recent developments have confirmed this prognosis. Indeed, the current economic situation, which is two months before the biggest crisis since the Great Depression hit, is better than we've experienced in years. And they then said we're stuck to their argument about rebalancing. Our central forecast remains indeed quite benign. Imagine if these are politicians reading this and thinking everything's great, my re-election is guaranteed, you know, I can balance the books, etc., etc. So the soft landing in the States, recovery in Europe, buoyant activity in Asia, sustained growth with strong job creation and falling unemployment. That's the sort of advice economists around the world are giving their governments. And even the person who got the job as Federal Reserve you know, governor, Fred Van Bernanke, is regarded by most people as an expert on the Great Depression. He didn't see it coming either. He was writing, he was writing back in 2004, but his tune didn't change in the subsequent years, saying that there'd been what he called the Great Moderation, which is a period where there's less re recessions are less frequent and milder, and unemployment and, and uh, inflation are both falling. And he called it this welcome change in the economy. So again, he thought everything was hunky-dory and he could take the credit for everything working out well, which he was doing in that paper. Now, there was a handful of economists who anticipated the crisis. 
but only a handful. How come? Well, it's because economics is not a science. It's more like a bunch of competing religions. We call them schools of thought inside the profession. But there are different approaches to analysing and believing how the economy operates. And those beliefs dominate what people say is going to happen in the future. Not as a science will do, where they've got a, you know, they can predict that the, the Curiosity rover will land in a particular location on Mars and get it right. But they actually, the mathematics and the engineering behind it is true science. Here it's religions, competing religions. And the vast majority belong to a school that's called neoclassical economics. Ben Bernanke and Paul Krugman are two prominent members of that school. Uh, only a handful of people who call themselves post-Keynesians and then some who call themselves Austrians actually said a crisis is coming. And uh, not about two or three years ago, a Dutch economist called Dirk Besmer went back through the literature and through media reports and said, can anybody legitimately say they saw the crisis coming? He identified 12 people and I was one of them. And I started putting this report out back in you see, November of 2006, I called it the recession we can't avoid. And ultimately got quite a bit of press coverage. This is probably the first two major articles in the uh, Age and City Morning Herald talking about my views. So University of Western Sydney was getting mentioned as one of the places saying a crisis is going to come, but we were completely ignored. From what would we know? We're a mining university. We don't have people to publish in the top journals. We don't have uh, the big reputation that even Sydney or New South Wales, let alone Harvard and uh, places like that that were saying everything is fantastic too. But I was out there raising an alarm saying I think a huge crisis is going to come along and plenty of my colleagues in the school were agreeing with me but not being quite as loud as I was. So the reason I called the crisis was the level of private debt and I was looking at this trend in the ratio of private debt to income in the country and saying that trend has to break and when it breaks, it's going to cause a downturn, a big, big downturn, the biggest we've seen since 1945. But that started right from the beginning of the end of the Second World War all the way through. Now, when you look at where debt is now, I said the trend would have to break and turn around, and it would cause a crisis when it did, and that's what happened. The trend did turn around. Now, it's, that's Australia. It's actually far more severe in America. And this is private debt in America when I made the course. It's going right back to 1945, all the way through the level of debt was rising from 45% of GDP at the end of the war to when I made the call about 260% of GDP. And I said, you guys are in for the, you know, the, the biggest crisis you've ever seen too. And this is what happened some years later, the same turnaround. But that's what actually caused the crisis. Now, most financial economists don't even consider the level of debt. They've got an analysis that their religion says the level of debt doesn't matter. My religion, which I think has got a bit more basis in science, says it does matter. And if you take a look over Australia's economic history, you can see there have been two previous periods where we had enormous levels of debt. Look at this one. We've got more than twice as much debt as we had in the Great Depression, and about 1.6 times as much as back in the 1890s, which is actually the worst crisis for Australia than the Great Depression. Now that period that I've highlighted there was the period that most economists and most bankers who are alive today grew up. So they thought that was normal. They didn't actually realise anything to worry about. And the same thing applies in America in a more extreme way. Here's America going back to 1920 now, and you can see the Great Depression sticking out like one sore thumb. Well, now it's obvious we're in a similar event to the Great Depression. And again, that's the period that most economists who are alive today grew up in. And because they ignore the level of debt they thought was happening, it was normal, the economic elements. It didn't prepare them for what happened here. They had no idea. So the question is, how do you understand it? Well, you've got to learn more than just the we, we teach neoclassical economics. We have some very good people who practice in that particular school. But they didn't, they, in general, that school didn't learn from the Great Depression. If you look at Ben Bernanke, he said the Great Depression was caught by the people who rang the Federal Reserve. And he'd never be as bad if he got the job. Well, he has got the job. And it's the second Great Depression, so I think it's justice there. But we teach other schools of thought as well, including post Keynesian. And we have subjects here, I guarantee, go and check any other university, you will not find courses of those names, history of economic thought, political economy, uh, behavioural finance, you won't find them taught at other universities in this country. In fact, in most of the rest of the world, you won't find them taught. Now, the greatest of the post-Keynesians was a guy called Hyman Minsky, and his argument about how we had to think about capitalism was said, great depressions have happened in the past. Why did they happen, and why hasn't it happened until he wrote this particular passage back in 82? And he said, 
to answer the question, you have to have a theory that can actually generate a depression. Now, most neoclassical economists believe the system reaches equilibrium. So they don't have a theory that does that. Minsky's theory goes like this. This is a picture of Hyman Minsky. He died about 15 years ago. He said, consider the economy in time. And you'll remember there's been some crisis in the past as a result of that. We're living in one right now, but 1990 is a good example for people of my vintage in this room. There's at least one close enough. Glad to see most of you are potential students. He said, therefore, most, think about the 2000 bubble, the, the, the busting of the dot com bubble back in 2000 for those that are younger in the room. See, firms and banks are all conservative about the amount of debt they'll take on, which means they only put forward conservative projects. But because the economy has recovered, most of those projects succeed. So people then think, oh, we were too conservative. If we borrowed more money, we would have made a bigger profit. So they start to revalue assets, and they start to do more, more gambling-type investments. And Minsky put it brilliantly, stability is destabilizing. If you have a period of tranquil growth in the economy, because that's the exception rather than the rule. It makes people's expectations rise. They borrow more money. For a while, the economy grows faster because they are investing. Good stuff happens, some good stuff. But they also start to finance what he calls the euphoric economy. When people start to behave like they're on drugs, making their investment decisions, and that is not entirely a joke. And they start to gamble and push asset prices up as well and believe they're being great investors by buying on a rising market. The money supply expands to support the whole thing, and ultimately you got what Minsky called Ponzi investors. Ten years ago, I had to explain what I meant by the word Ponzi. Anybody, have you heard the name Ponzi before in this room? You haven't. Okay, well, that's good because you haven't done enough economic yet or read enough business literature. But it's now Ponzi is now turning up as a description of people who are actually bankrupt all the time. The way they make money is by buying and selling assets in a rising market. But the debt they borrow to buy the assets has actually cost them more to service and they make profit out of the organisations. The classic Alan, uh, Ponzi in Australia, the guy called Alan Bond, do you know that name? Alan Bond, okay. He went bankrupt after he bought the Forex Brewery in Queensland. And people said, how on earth did he go bankrupt selling beer to Queenslanders? Well, the answer was he, paid, he borrowed too much money to buy the brewery. Even the cash flow from the Queenslanders drinking beer wasn't enough to pay off the debt he took out. So they drive up the interest rates, rising levels of debt and more and more speculative projects means that something starts to fail. People have actually got sensible investments get a bit worried. They, they sell what some of their investments into the market and that rise of prices it disappears and the economy crashes. So you go from a boom to a bust. And the very first ones to fold are the Ponzi's like Alan Bond. Um, now that happens, the private system economy collapses, there's another crisis. The money supply goes into reverse, investment evaporates, the economy slows down, you're back where you started again. And that really is 2000 to 2007, that description I've given you just then. Now, it can keep on going, but the trouble is each time you restart, you restart with a higher level of debt. And the great danger is one of these days you strike a crisis that's so big, you can't restart the whole thing. Well, that's what actually happened to us. That's where we are now. We've got to that level of debt. Now, that's the verbal description. One thing which... Uh, I do at UWS, which I would have colleagues who could work with me in as well, is we use dynamic modelling tools to build models like that. So if I just bring this system up and run it, that's the simulation of an economy based on Minsky's model. This is the ratio of debt to GDP over here on the left-hand screen, and over here you've got the employment rate, and you have a series of cycles where you go through a boom slump, boom slump, but ultimately, bang, you borrow too much money and the economy crashes. So that's the sort of thing we're modelling here and teaching here, which again you will not find at the other universities. Now, what's actually economically going on behind that once we get into a slump, the level of spending in the economy is just like your own personal spending. It's the sum of income plus whatever new debt you take on. That aggregates to the national level. So total spending is income plus change in debt. Now, when people are reducing their debt, spending is less than income and you go into a huge slump. So this is showing you the change in private debt in America is the blue line, and the red line is the number of people who have got a job in America. You can see how strongly they correlate to each other. The dotted line across the screen is when debt's going from rising to falling, and you can date the crisis right to when that rate of growth of debt turned around. And now, how long, if we continue deleveraging, how long would this go on for? Well, I hate to be depressing about this, but depressions are depressing. 
it could take two decades. Because if you look at the level of debt America's in and extrapolate how fast it's reducing debt now, it'll get back to the level it was in 1970 by 2025. Now that might sound like an extreme prognosis to make, but look at Japan. Japan began its crisis in 1990, it's still stuck there two decades later. So these things can go on for a hell of a long time. What about Australia? We think, think we're different. Well, we are, certainly, but we're also in a bigger debt crisis than we've ever been in beforehand. Again, that's the same chart I showed you beforehand. To compare it to the Americans, of course, we've got a high level of debt than we ever had before, but it's lower than the, American, the United States has. So this is superimposing the American data on top of that. So one reason we're not as severe as the rest of the world, we're not in quite as much debt compared to the rest of the world, but we're in more debt than we've ever handled before. Now, we avoided the crisis largely by slowing down the process, you can see in America, of reducing debt. This is graphing America's level of debt on the uh, right-hand scale and Australia's on the left-hand scale, so I can make them comparable. And you can see the Americans hit a peak and they're just plunging. We hit a peak and we bounced. We actually went to borrowing more money again for a while. And the reason was the government encouraged people to do that with what they call the first home owner's boost, and I call it the first home vendor's boost, because the money actually went to the people selling the property rather than the people buying it. So by delaying the leveraging, we slowed it down, but we've still got the same basic dynamics. And now this should show you what's happened with the level of debt. The red line is America's from debt rising to debt falling dramatically. Australia's debt rising then started to fall, but we bounced. And again, it was the encouragement to get back into borrowing that got us out of it. So we haven't got out of the crisis by not doing what caused it. We've got out of the crisis by doing what began the crisis in the first place. And we also had a much bigger and much better targeted government stimulus program than the Americans as well. So private debt is what matters. It's far bigger than public debt, though all the debate is about how to reduce public debt. This is why I get exasperated when I hear discussions both in Australia and America. This is America's level of private debt and public debt. Which one would you worry about? The red line is private, the blue line is public. The debate's all about the public debt, uh, but actually it's the rise of private debt during the boom and the crash in public private debt during the slump that actually causes the depression. And the government's just responding to what's happening there. Now the same thing applies in Australia. There's the red line. Again, I'm using a bigger scale now so you can see just how gigantic the current level of debt is. Little blue thing down the bottom, that's not a squiggle, that's what the politicians worry about. That's the ratio of public debt in this country to GDP. That's what they should be worrying about. The fact that they ignored it for so long is why we're in a crisis globally. They would manage to delay it by not borrowing, by uh, continuing to borrow money. So UWS, the reason I'm giving this presentation is to show that there's material you get taught at UWS you will not get taught at any other university. Partly because of the range of people who would, who would teach here and the fact we've committed ourselves to being what we call a pluralist department where we teach not just one, one extreme, not just the other, we try to teach the whole lot. So you get neoclassical and you get the broader stuff. Now if you go to a university like New South Wales or Sydney or Macquarie, you'll get Marshall, which is the basis of microeconomics, a guy called Hicks who's the basis of macro, and I love the fact this guy's praying right now, this is Ben Bernanke. Carrying on the modern tradition. You'll also get these people, Marx, Keynes, and Joan Robinson, a range of different views, ways of thinking about the economy. See, and you get a deeper education as well, because we're more critical of all schools of thought. They all get a, a rough going over here, and we're able to maintain good personal relations inside the department as well, which matters, of course, when you're having debates like this. And we're using and developing tools the other universities don't even know can exist, let alone that they do. So here's a simulation program that I'm working on now to simulate the economy as a financial system. And uh, that sort of modeling is what we call dynamic modeling. What most economists do is called comparative statics. It doesn't cover processes through time properly. So you get, believe it or not, a better education in economics if you come here than if you go to Sydney or New South Wales or Macquarie. Thank you. Any questions? Apart from how do I talk so fast? <laughs>